Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. 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 Clap your hands, all you people. Lift up your voice, it's like a puppet in Zion. Let the Lord be the place this morning. Let him hear how grateful you are to him. Just for being God. Just for being a wonderful Savior. Just for being King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The song was said, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Come, let us exalt his name together. That was an invitation for us to corporately praise God. Amen. But you have to make it up in your mind that if no one else praises him, that you're going to give him what is to his name. Don't tell the people. The Lord has come and glorious. He's won every victory, every battle. The Lord has won them all. Because he is the God of battles. And he is a winner all the time. And he causes us always to triumph in Christ Jesus. You are the praiser because you're on the winning side. Everybody that's able to stand to rise to your feet and reverence God for just the next 30 seconds. If you're able to, I want you to give him your best praise this morning. I need God to hear your best praise this morning. The song is said, I need to appoint you. Thus will I bless thee while I live. Let everything that hath breath praise ye the Lord. If you can inhale and exhale, you are commanded to praise God. Thank you, Jesus. He did not say take, say, take in consideration how you feel. The command is not about your feelings. It is about giving God what is due, his name. Hallelujah. So we are commanded to worship the Lord and to praise him. Amen. In everything, we give him thanks. Aren't you glad to be in the house of God one more time? Aren't you glad that God has kept you another week? The old saints would say, from her time of day to her seen and unseen, God has kept us. Then they say, He kept me with a mind stayed on Him. If your mind's been on Jesus, that's a blessing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come, Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. We praise you, God, for what you are doing in this hour. We thank you for your spirit and your grace upon us, O oh God, in this moment. God, we don't take it for granted that we're here. We honor you. We honor your name. We magnify you. We exalt you. That you are worthy of all the praise, the glory, and the honor. Thank you for being God in our lives. Thank you for your grace being upon us and it being sufficient for us. And thank you that your strength is being made perfect in our weakness. We ask God that you would touch the ears of the hearers, touch the hearts of this great congregation. We ask God that you would 
Give me, Lord God, the words to say in the name of Jesus. Touch my mind, Lord God. Be in my thinking, touch my tongue, and be in my speaking. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray that your word, God, would go out and heal, deliver, and set free. Well, you said it would not come back void, but it would accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you send it. We need you to send your word. In the name of Jesus, send it for every affliction, every addiction, every bondage, every oppression, every depression. In the name of the Lord Jesus, every ailment, every infirmity, high blood, low blood, cancer, diabetes, COVID-19, whatever it is, send your word and heal in the name of the Lord Jesus. Break every chain, every fetter, every yoke, every physical in the name of Jesus by your word, God. Do it for your name's sake and do it for thy own glory. We thank you for the opportunity, Lord God, just to give your name praise one more time, just to magnify you, just to tell a dying world about a living Savior. Thank you, Lord God for grace and mercy that follows us all the days of our life. We deserve judgment, but you gave us mercy, and we thank you that you pitied us, God, that you cared about us, God, that you had compassion on us. We give it glory. God, if there's anything in us that should not be, we ask you to take it out and strengthen us with our desire to be saved, to be whole, and to walk up right before you. We thank you. Now we ask that the word would follow on good ground, spring up and bring forth fruit unto perfection. If there's not someone among us that's not saved, Lord God, let them ask, what must I do to be saved? And Lord God, in all things, we will give you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Let every heart say amen. I need you to clap your hands to the clap the lotion off of us. I don't need you just to clap. I need you to because it's not a round of applause. Now grab your Bible before you take your seat. Let us look into the word of the Lord out of the gospel according to St. Luke, chapter number 12. Amen. St. Luke. Rise to us in this book chapter. Starting at verse number 16. It is a continuation of the fall. That's what we talked about in the book. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth with him. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruit. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. 
and there will I restore all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto them, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then the fool shall those things be which thou hast provided. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich for God. Second Corinthians. But we have this treasure in urban lessons that the excellency of the power may be of God in my Just we're doing kind of one word. Today we're going to talk about the treasure. Treasure. The church has both gained and in this hour has lost in this particular season of the The transition for some from corporate worship to shelter in place and now back to another version of corporate worship has rattled many in this season. Some have struggled to adjust while others have lost a sense of both identity and community, as well as connection to the house of life. Although my emphasis really is not on the transition of how we just come back to normalcy, but there is something that God wants us to address in this particular passages of Scripture, these scriptures that will remain for those of us that will remain connected to him that we must observe. Those of us who are fighting to remain steadfast according to the scripture and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing this, that our labor, the Bible says, is not in vain in the Lord. And during this time, believe it or not, this is one of probably one of the most blessed times that the church has experienced. Sir. And I say that from both a natural and a spiritual standpoint because for those who decided that they would commit, stay, would remain connected to the things of God, you have been, you have grown in grace. Yes, yes. You have uh, sharpened your prayer life. You have recommitted to spiritual things. You have refocused on things that were really of importance. Yes. You, I found out that you can do a lot of things uh, or you need less than yes. what you thought you yes. needed right. in yes. this season. Yes. God calls us to reevaluate some things, redetermine some things, reconstruct some things, refocus some things, renew some things, amen, disconnect some things that he might be the center focus of everything that we do, everything that we say, and moving forward, we would be a better version of him right. in us. Yes. For the sake of clarity, I want to examine the text here in this Gospel of Luke chapter 12. And I want to start with verse number 15 as the backdrop of the text. 
The Bible says here in this 12th chapter that Jesus makes a statement in the 15th verse, and he warns us of the dangers of covetedness. Right. Warns man of the danger of covetousness. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has to warn us because he says to us that man's life consisted not of the things that he possesses. And it's, it's important that we make note of that, that as God increases you naturally and even spiritually, that we have to be mindful of the spirit of covetedness. Mm -hmm. Scripture goes on to say, and if you look at this word, it is this Greek word, plenoexia. Now, I, I'm going to spell it because it's Greek, but I'm not Greek. It's <laughs> P-L-E-O-N-E-X-I-A. And it simply means to have a desire for more. And it's not it's different from just having a desire. Uh, it's because this covetousness is having a desire for more, but never being satisfied once you get it. All right. yes. The Bible says in the book of Exodus, the 20th chapter, that one of the Ten Commandments was, Thou shalt not covet. Right. The Bible says, not covet your neighbor's house, his wife, his manservant, his maidservant, his oxen, his asses, or anything that belongs to his neighbor. Right. So when he did not name it, that anything covered anything that you would want that is not yours, that yes. you would desire that does not yes. belong to you. It could be something natural and it could be something spiritual because there's a difference between admiration and covetedness. I can admire and I can uh, uh, look up to, but I don't have to, to desire what you have. Right. Amen. Right. And so he said, I need you to be aware of that spirit because I found out that people know how to navigate through lack. But it's more difficult to navigate through a season where you don't lack anything. Yeah, right. Right. Because in that season, there is some kind of mindset that I need God less because I have more. Yes. All right. All right. And so here we see in the text that covetousness, this word is always used in a negative sense. And the Bible says, as we look at it in the scripture, in Romans chapter number 1, verse number 29, the apostle Paul talks to us about this particular spirit. And the Bible says that uh, part of the fruit of what they were doing in that first chapter caused them not only to become reprobate, but be filled with all fruits or manner of fornication and adultery and covetousness. Mm -hmm. They said the fruits of them moving away from God caused them to covet other things. Mm -hmm. I need you to just walk with me. So this particular sin is named among all the other sins uh, in that first chapter. And the Bible says again, Apostle Paul in Ephesians 5, he warns the church against saying uh, or being coming to this, and he said, don't let that spirit be named among you not one time yeah. as you that are saints. Yeah. He said, don't even let it na be named among you one time yeah. that you're coveting something that does not belong to you. Yeah. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, if you're taking notes, verse number 5, the Apostle Paul again says uh, that he maintained his integrity while he was preaching. He says, when I came to you, I did not come with flattering words, nor did I come under a cloak of covetousness. In other words, I had no hidden agenda. I had no hidden motives. When I preached the gospel to you, I wasn't trying to extort money out of you. I wasn't trying to take advantage of you. I wasn't trying to do anything behind closed doors. When I told you about Jesus, I was doing it authentically. I was doing it with integrity. And I was doing it under the power and the auspices of the Holy Ghost. Second Peter chapter number 2. The Apostle Peter warns the saints that some will become victim of false prophets who make merchandise of the saints, extorting them because they are covetousness. Now, I've always talked about this because we're supposed to be a pure church, a holy church, a righteous church. The Bible says that the grace of God has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should be righteous, sober, and godly in this present world. And so I warn the church that there are going to be people, men, 
under the under the the guise of being uh, ministers or, or, or preachers or whoever, and they're going to try to extort the church or extort the people of God because they have a heart to covet. I'm going to just make it plain. You don't have to buy salvation. It's already been bought. You don't have to buy deliverance. You don't have to buy a miracle. You don't have to buy healing. You don't have to sow seed to get blessed. You don't have to spin around three times to get a financial from God. The Bible has made it real plain. He is Lord of right. all. He is the high priest. He has already shed his blood. And he can come boldly to the throne of grace and find, find help in the time of need. If you need an answer, you can call his name yeah. and God will send an answer. Yeah. And so I must expose this spirit because there are many vulnerable people in the world who are very desperate in these last days and, and they're looking for something they don't know exactly what they're looking for but what they're looking for they don't know is Jesus and, and if you get Jesus you get healing you get deliverance you get miracles you get finances you get strength you get peace you get joy all you need is Jesus and, and we sung the song today about two or three and all they said in the song was Jesus 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 because the Bible said neither is there salvation in any other there is no name under heaven, give among men, whereby you must be saved. So much so that he said, Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in that name. Hey, hey. Come on. Hey, hey. That's it. Oh, so, so, because we are in the last days and Jesus is on his way back, he's making sure that the church does not fall victim and pray to charlatans and, and false prophets yeah. and false teachers who will be. Who because of their own lust and own desires will make merchandise of the saints. Oh God, I thank God for his covering grace. I thank him for his blood. I thank him for wisdom. I thank if you need to know an answer, the answer is in the scripture. He's given you 66 books. From Genesis to Revelation, it talks about him. Everything that was done in the Old Testament pointed to the Jesus that was coming. Everything that you need, it is wrapped up in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you do never, you never, the Bible said, lest Satan get advantage of you, we are not ignorant of his devices. And so the Bible then says, it gives us the remedy of covetousness in Colossians, the third chapter, verse number five. The Bible said the remedy for covetousness is to mortify your members. In other words, don't let it live in you. If you see that spirit creep upon you, don't let it exist in your space. You must mortify, crucify Make dead the deeds of your members that would desire things outside of the will of God. Sometimes the desire is not just things. Sometimes it's a desire for relationships and people. In this day that you're living in, you must understand the closer you get to God, the smaller circle you have around you. Oh God, and I often say that Jesus started with a multitude pulled out 12, ended up with 3, and by the time he got to Calvary, he was by himself. You must understand that the closer you walk with God, the closer you are to Jesus, the smaller your circle will be, the smaller your communication, the smaller of the people around you will be, because everybody is not going to do what you desire in your heart to do, and everybody is not going to go after God the way you want to go after God, and everybody's not going to praise him as hard as you praise him, and everybody's not going to love him as deep as you love him, but if nobody goes, you got to go. Nobody praises him. You got to praise them. And if nobody believes, you got to believe. Yeah. If you gotta go by yourself, just get yeah. 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 Yourself, yes. but don't yes. stop your journey. Oh God, oh my God. 
Yes. Our faces, yes. you must understand. When the Bible said, come out from among them and be ye separate, he wasn't just saying the world. He was saying carnal people as well. Because in the house of God, the Bible said there are many vessels, some to honor and some to dishonor. There are vessels of gold, silver, hay, and clay. He says, but all vessels are in the same house. And you've got to be careful that you're not going to hang around with folks that are hay. Because when the fire starts... When the fire starts to the the fire is going to determine what sort you are. And if you're hay, you're not going to be able to go through the fire. But if you're going to sin, you can withstand the heat of the fire. So quit choosing relationships based upon whether they're nice to you or based upon, based upon whether they give you something. When you find somebody in your life, you tell them, if the fire starts, can you withstand the fire? And now God is in a place in these last days. Now he is beginning to separate both the wheat and the tear and the goat and the sheep. Yeah. All God is doing in this last days is separating. Yes. And he never right. gives us the opportunity to separate. I heard you, Elder. He doesn't tell us that we have the authority. The Bible says that in the last days the reapers will come and will do the separating. Right. But you see the distinction now happening as things began to turn and shift. The people that you thought were walking close to God. Amen. And the very ones that you thought you could rely upon are finding themselves in a position where you cannot get anything from them. They used to be the depositor term in your life, but now you're going to them and they're empty because God never expected them to be who you went to to get what you needed from Him. He expected you to go to Him to get what you needed, and that's why He cut off people, and that's why they can no longer give you. Revelation and instruction and help and assistance because they were the book that dried up and it's now time for you to move on to something else. The God that we serve will make your book dry up. He made it dry up. He made it dry up. And now you find there's no commonality between the oh God, I think you have nothing in common. You have nothing in common with him. Not even the fact that you both say you love Jesus because you don't love him like they say they love him. Uh -huh. They don't love him like you say. And you find out that the things that they go after, they allow it to be mixed with carnality. Where uh -huh. now you don't want to be bothered. Uh -huh. Have you ever been in a place where now when you hear stuff, you just don't want to be bothered? Yeah. That, that, that if it's not spiritual, if it's not something that edifies, if it's not something that builds you up, it's not something that makes you stronger, you just don't want to be bothered. And now you get irritated like a fly in a room burning around your head. That time they come around, you just don't want to be bothered. Because now the Holy Ghost is pulling on your spirit to do something different. You've come through a pandemic. You've dealt with COVID-19. You had things happen. Folk around you died. Friends that you that you that you love. Now that now they're dealing with issues. And now you're more serious about the God that you serve. And now you just don't want to be proud. And, and, and so he says here in the text that we must mortify all covetousness. And then he says, Jesus, I love him. He says, let me tell you a story. A parable. You know what a parable is. It's a natural story that gives a spiritual understanding. Something natural that was to be spiritual understanding. Let me tell you a parable. Mm -hmm. He said there was certain man, mm -hmm. and I like the text because he didn't name it, so you could put your name there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there was certain rich.
rich man okay. that brought forth plentifully. That means that he had accumulated great wealth and he was still in a place where things were happening. Great wealth was still coming to him. And the Bible says he fought within himself. Yeah. I need to pause there. Mm -hmm. Did you ever just start thinking? Mm -hmm. Someone say, God, yeah. the problem was not that he was thinking. The problem is that his thoughts did not include God. Oh First mistake then that he makes is that he has a conversation. He has a conversation with himself, and he did not invite God. The reason why people sometimes find they lost themselves, lost in their own head, is because they did not include God. Yes. In the conversation yes. they were having with themselves. Yes. Yes. All depression is, yes. come on, okay. is a thought okay. that does not include God. Right. Yeah, come on now. Oh God. Yes. My God. Because wherever God is, oh. come on. Uh, we said it last week, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is, there is liberty. Right. So how can I have a thought? That causes depression and God is standing in the room. Yes. I either have to dismiss one thing and invite the other. Or put out one thing to let the other have preeminence. But both can exist in the same place. I forget the Bible. I inhabit the praise of my people. So if I praise him, he comes down in my midst. Mm -hmm. 
And there are many things, there are many devices in a man's heart. There's a lot of things that you ponder on a daily basis. One scientist said that a person has up to 50,000 thoughts a day. Yes. And if you don't have the Spirit of God navigating all the information that is being directed towards you on a regular basis every single day, mm -hmm. you will be somewhere in the funny farm playing with your lips. My Lord, help us not. You, need God, you need the helmet of salvation yeah. to guard your mind. Uh -huh. Bible yes, says God. also in Proverbs 3, we read it all the time, in all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. In other words, when you begin to ponder a thing, you must instantly ask God into the conversation. God, I'm thinking about this. What do you think? God, this came across my mind. How do you feel about uh -huh. that? Yes. 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 Right. Number two, we then ask. Now he's talking to himself. And then he begins to ask himself a question. Uh -huh. He says to himself, what shall I do? Because you must understand that your thinking will eventually become your action. Amen. Somebody tells me, Master, I just, you know, I, I just, it was a mistake. I just, I said, you thought it first. Come on here. Come on here. You played it all out in your mind first. Yes. I know regal cinema is closed, but y'all got some regal going on in your minds. <laughs> you didn't even pay to get in. You just sat in the sat in the theater. And the thought became a question. What do I do now? Jesus. Notice the text. God, during this conversation, remains silent. Because God will let you think of things. I love him. Because we're not robots. He will let us think of things. He remains silent. But he has already spoken in the scripture, because when the man said to himself, what shall I do? John, John 15 had already answered that question, the fifth verse, without me. You can do nothing. So he had the answer. I, I'm going to assume he had the answer. If he didn't have it, you have it. Also says to us, the prophet Isaiah reaffirms this in the 30th chapter of Isaiah when he says, Woe, woe to the rebellious children, say of the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me. Who come with a spirit, but is not mine. In other words, why do you keep asking? Something less than God. <laughs> to do something that only a God can do. So you're taking counsel. Y'all got y'all got people on speed down. Y'all got on speed down because we don't memorize memorize numbers no more. But he said you're taking counsel. But not of me. This man was more dangerous because he took counsel with his own self. Mm -hmm. The only one I know that 
takes counsel with his own will is God. Yeah. Ephesians 1.11. Yeah. He works all things after the counsel of his own will. He's the only one who can consult his own self, ask the question, and get an answer. Yeah. I'm talking about God. Yeah. I'm talking about God who, according to Proverbs, the 8th chapter, talked, had a conversation with his own wisdom. Yeah. This man thought he could answer, ask and answer his own question. The Bible says here, says I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to pull down my barns. It's a Greek word, which means storehouse. Pull down my storehouses and I'm going to build me bigger ones. Mm -hmm. I used to take in the Old Testament, they used to take the grain, and they would take empty cisterns under the ground. Because mm -hmm. normally the cisterns that they created were for water, mm -hmm. that would water the city, that would be the water supply for the city, but they would take an empty cistern and put grain in it. And so much so that when they put it in there, it could be preserved for years. And then later on, they began to build their storehouses above ground. But his intent was to build something bigger than what he had already built. His intent was to build something bigger than what he had already built. The Bible said, except the Lord build the house. They that labor, labor in vain. The Bible says now he's found himself in a position where he is doing things without God. Not just thinking them, but proposing to do them without God. Bible now says he's going to build a storehouse, a bigger one, to house his grain, to house his things, to house his belongings. And then he says something here that calls God to start talking. He says, after I build my bigger barns, I'm going to start talking to my soul. It's okay if the if the conversation is still here. But now the conversation has now gone a little bit deeper. He says, I'm going to say to my soul. This is the Greek word suke. The word suke in the Greek means the breath of life. I'm going to start talking to the breath of my life. Wow. <laughs> the same breath that God uh -huh. breathed into Adam. Right. Right. And Adam became a living nephes, a living soul. Yes. The Bible said the same breath that God gave Adam. Mm -hmm. The same breath that the Bible says that no man has power to retain. Right. He says, I'm going to talk to that now. God broke his silence because now if we look at the text the commentator here helped me 63 words that this man uttered 11 of those 63 words was about what he was going to do notice here God never addresses that he was thinking wrong. He never addressed that he was going to tear down his barns, build bigger ones. He never addressed that he was just going to eat, drink, and be married. But when he started talking about his own soul, God had to talk. 
the soul, that part of man that God let him borrow. That part of him that originated from God, that one day will go back to God. He says, Wow, fool. Tell it twice in the scripture that he would call anybody a fool, the Pharisees. <laughs> said, Y'all are fools. And this man. He said, This night. Thy soul is required of thee. Now, when I looked up, as you know, I'm kind of a word person. Shall be required. That Greek word means to demand back. He gave his soul a demand letter. I want you to give me back. What I gave you. The warning then comes after the parable. He says, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And now, parable is a segue into what I'm trying to tell you today, he says. So is everyone that lays up treasure for himself and has no rich relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice in the text, he was not rebuked for his substance. The Bible says, I've given man power to get well. It's not Joseph who took his body. He was a rich man. I think God has never been intimidated by someone who had an issue with God. He never said that money was evil. He just said the love of it was. Right. Right. So he never rebuked him for his status in life. Didn't rebuke him for wanting to take his material possessions and put a place for them to house them. The problem was that he says that his soul was now going to take ease. Now my soul can take ease. That word take ease means to cause to cease spiritual movement mm -hmm. God, I thank you. All right. All right. that his relationship with God now is in retirement <laughs> <laughs> Woo. But now I could just sit back and take it easy he said no I need you to work while it's day because night is coming and no man shall be able to work. This word take ease means now I will become self-indulgent. It would now be become about me. And I meet people all the time. Well, what about me? What about you? I just need, I just need time for me. Me. During Bible study? Yeah. All right. All right. All right. All right. I put my time in. When the soul begins to take ease, it starts disconnecting from God. Because you can't take ease from the work of the Lord without being disconnected from the Lord of the work. So when he said to his soul, my soul now has the right just to do what it wants to do. 
And I'm coming after the spirit of apathy. Because one thing that was leashed out in the church was this apathy that caused us to be unconcerned in a nice way. It's camouflaged in COVID. Wow. It's, it's wrapped up in a virus. Wow. There you go. Come on. I'm not, oh God. I'm not talking about not to be aware. Saying that. I'm saying what happened is it became an excuse not to stay connected to the power of God. And it became a long vacation away from the Holy Ghost. And the shaking that's going on for some is you trying to get back what you lost. Because someone in their spiritual mind said, it's the time for me to just take it easy. Oh God. But you must understand that now is the time where you should have drawn closer to God than ever before. And that it was never the will of God for a virus to wipe out your relationship with Him. Y'all can dance later. I need to talk to y'all now. <laughs> and so it's wrapped up in, you know, and then they made it easy. Because you didn't even have to work. They were sending checks to you. Come on now. Come on. <laughs> and some of the things was like, woo! I can sit at home. I don't have to get up and go to church. I can just pick up the phone and let pastors pray. I can watch it on television and then go to the mailbox and pay my bills. And what we don't understand is a spirit of apathy crawled into our houses. Called into our spiritual lives. And now we are like this rich man that says, I could just take it easy. Bible then lets us to know that apathy is the lack of interest, enthusiasm, or concern. Having more but needing God less. I'm going to come to the conclusion of the matter. He says, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Rich toward God, then rich God. Mm -hmm. That preposition in between toward, connecting one to the other. How do I then remain rich in God or rich toward God or rich in a relationship with God? We first must define what rich is. Mm -hmm. It is not, according to the scripture, the abundance of your possessions. It's not your stuff. It's not your things. It's not where you live. It's not what you drive. It's not your house. It's not your house. Rich is to be enriched spiritually by spiritual things. To have a hunger that only God can feel. It is lacking nothing 
as it relates to your walk with him, that you are complete in him according to the scripture. It is the blessing of salvation. It is enough to be supplied, that you have enough supply in every area of your life to navigate through every area of your life. That nothing can hinder your walk with God, whether you're at home or in a building, nothing can keep you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That you can transfer your praise from a building to your bedroom or from your building to your kitchen and you lose nothing. That's rich. That you know how to call a praise service in your house and in your car. That you had enough word in you just to sustain you. And if they kept the doors locked, you would still be saved when you came back. This time only, and I said it uh, probably in Bible study, it only revealed who we really were. And we became more of what we already were. Whatever you were before, Everything happened, you just became more fat. Ah. I want you to turn to Jeremiah 9, and then I'm going to conclude the matter. I want to read this. I hope you took some notes and you can go back and dissect this, the scriptures and get a greater understanding, but I want you to read the words of the prophet Jeremiah in the ninth chapter, 20. Oh God. 22nd. 23. It said, Thus said the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him glory him that glorieth glory in this, that number one, he understandeth and knoweth me. If you're going to glory anything, Glory in the fact that you understand and know me. That I am the Lord which exercises loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight. You want to make me happy? This is what I delight in, saith the Lord. Finally, I don't want to leave you in a solemn state. I want to leave you with the words of the Apostle Paul. He says, I want to tell you where the real treasure is. Amen. Amen. Oh, yeah. Come on. Oh. I'm going to tell you where the lasting treasure is. Mm. Yes, yes. He says, we have this treasure. In an earthen vessel. That the excellency, the exceeding power, may be of hope, God, and not of us. Amen. This word treasure is the same word in the Greek as storehouse. Mm -hmm. Come on, here. Watch the text, y'all. There's a storehouse. Yes. You don't have to look far. You don't have to go build it. You don't have to get wood and, and, and water and brick. There is a storehouse and it's down on the inside. It's in an earthen vessel. Oh God. Now when I read this, but your name 
say she's going to explain. <laughs> when I read this, I used to read an elder that the comparison is the treasure to the vessel. It's not. He says, I put this treasure, this storehouse, in jars of clay. I put them in some jars that had cracks in them. You know what you look like when he found you. Some jars that were broken. Some jars that had been marred and some jars that were scarred and some jars that were just empty in life. I put them in jars of clay. I couldn't put them in vessels of gold. I said, well, God, why didn't you? He gave me an analogy, Elder David. He said, if I put a gold bar Mm. On a silver tray, you're looking at both the silver and the gold because both is shining. Uh -huh. Come on now. He said it would distract the, the silver mm. would distract from the beauty mm. of the gold. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. He said, so I knew uh -huh. that I did not want to put myself in anything that could compete with how glorious I am. So I chose you. Broken and messed up. That's drugs, alcohol, liars, and thieves. So when I poured myself in you, that they would never even look at the jar. They would just look at the essence of my past. to something that when you looked at it you couldn't even see it all you saw was me of this world. Yes. Woo, God. Yes. I took the scourge of this earth. Yes. I took the ex everything in this yes. room. Yes. And I made you a habitation of my spirit yes. through the power of the Holy Ghost. I poured in something that the world said couldn't contain me. Yes. I fixed the container so now you can hold me. Until I found out, 
that the difference between that class and coach was paper products. You give them a platter, uh -huh. you give me paper, uh -huh. right. but you're serving the same right. meal. All right. All right. Yeah. All right. And so I said to myself, you know, I'm not going to fight, just give me a seat. Mm -hmm. okay. Just give me a seat. Because as long as the meal is the same, yeah. All right. yeah. Yeah. It don't matter what you serve it on. Yes, yes. Come on. Come on. And God in his infinite wisdom. Yeah. He says, I have one spirit. One. And I'm going to take the least likely of the Chinese. Well, <laughs> I didn't say China. I said China. I'm going to serve my spirit yeah. on the same thing. Whosoever will, let it come and drink of the water of life freely. In him there's no Jew, no Greek, no bond, no free. He's not talking about one spirit, by one blood. He's made of one nation. We just got to make sure yes. that we get the treasure. Yes. 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 We just got to make sure yes. we get this treasure. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care what dirt, debris that the devil tried to drag you through before you got here. Yes. Yes. He said, I have poured out my spirit on right. yes. all flesh. Yes. Wow. Yes. And this treasure is now in an earthen vessel. If I never can tear down a barn and build a bigger one, if I never have more than what I can store, as long as I have this treasure, let the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Somebody on the praise it for the real. Write down these three scriptures before we go. Three ways to know that you are rich towards God. Ephesians 3.16. Number one, that you are strengthened in your inner man. How do you know that you're rich towards God? Because you're stronger. You're in a fight, you fight till you get stronger. Amen. You're in a war, war till you get stronger. You know you're rich toward God because you come out of it stronger. Amen. Number two, Colossians 3 and 10. You come out wiser. Yeah. The Bible says be renewed with the knowledge of of Jesus Christ. You come out with the wisdom of God. The war was not about winning. Winning has already been won. Right, right, right. Amen. He always calls us to triumph. That's Bible. The war is about wisdom. That there's something God that causes in you that you didn't know before. 
This season that we've been in was about gaining the wisdom of God. Because God put us in a place where we didn't know what to do. We had to ask him. So you come out number two, wiser. Finally, number three, Ephesians 4.24. You come out a new man. Displaying the character of his righteousness and his holiness. In other words, you come out looking more like him. I'm stronger, wiser, and I look more like him. That's when you know that you're rich toward God. Somebody ought to be praying. Oh, the rich folk. Give the Lord honor. Give the Lord honor. We became poor that we might be rich and we weren't talking about sunset. His poverty made us rich toward him. I'm stronger. Face of music. Making an altar call. Wiser. My character is more like this. The Bible says this, and we're making an altar here. What does it profit a man to gain his whole work and lose his soul? Then he asks another question What will a man give in exchange for his soul? What price have you put on your soul that you would give up him to give it? That price is too high for you. Way too high. You have to make up in your mind that you're going to continue and complete the journey. Amen. Yeah. We don't know what the journey looks like moving forward. Amen. All we know is that our focus is to endure to the end that we might be saved. Making an appeal for those that may want to give their life to Jesus. Okay. The Bible says that according to St. John, we must be born. Water and spirit. He that is born of flesh is flesh, he that is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not thyself to be request. Be born again. That's you today. You've never been buried into death by baptism according to Romans the sixth chapter. That you might rise to walk in the newness of life. We invite you to come. He the preached from the day of Pentecost and asked the men and women, what shall we do? He said, repent. Let the Noah be turn, change. Be baptized, baptizo, to immerse every one of you. That means nobody left out. And he said, How? In the name of the Lord Jesus. You shall be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises unto you to your children to live in a far off, even as the Lord our God shall come. You want prayer? The altar is open. And God bless you, heaven smile upon you. Thank <laughs> you.